Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to welcome a fine artist, Richard Tushman, as tonight's guest speaker. Oh, behind me. <laughs> Um, originally trained as a painter and printmaker, Richard began to experiment with digital imaging in the early 1990s, developing a signature style that combined his interests in graphic design, photography, painting, and assemblage. This digital work found a wide audience commercially, and his work graces the pages of magazines, annual reports, book jackets, and catalogs. Clients include Adobe Systems, The New York Times, Penguin, Sony Music, Newsweek, and Random House. Among others, his work has been recognized by American Photography, Print, Photo District News, American Illustration, and Prix de la Photographie Paris. His latest exhibition, Once Upon a Time in Kashimirs, is currently on view at the Klomchin Gallery, so don't miss out. It's a beautiful show, and I, it's up for another week or so? Yeah, so April. April 9th. Uh, so please help me welcome Richard Tushman to our lecture series. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you all for coming. I'm having a show. Um, okay, so uh, what I do in my fine art is that I uh, create these fictional narratives in the form of uh, staged uh, painterly photographs. Okay. And I, I suppose what I've s sort of become known for, what the kind of the catch is, is that the, um, the sets in these images uh, I make as uh, miniature uh, dioramas first. And, and then I photograph the people later and combine them um, in Photoshop. And so I've now created uh, two bodies of work uh, using this technique. Um, this is the most recent body uh, called Once Upon a Time in Kashmir, which I describe as an open-ended novella, you know, told in photographs. Um, and the first body of work uh, was titled Hopper Meditations, uh, which was a photographic, a personal photographic response to the paintings of Edward Hopper. Um, so this is a diorama from Hopper Meditations, and this is uh, an image, you know, using uh, that diorama. Um, so probably the most frequent question I get, or certainly one of the most frequent questions I get, is, you know, why? You know, why do you go to all that trouble? You know, why not, you know, just, uh, you know, find a location, you know, get the models there, and make the photograph like a normal person, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, a lot of times I'll, you know, have jokingly say, well, I don't know, I guess I'm just a, you know, a glutton for punishment, you know, um, but on a small scale. Um, and when it's partly true, but um, the, the longer answer is that, you know, this technique, this rather convoluted technique, is something that really has evolved over uh, many, many years. Um, and it's really kind of an adaptation that sort of brings together you know, all the various skill sets um, that I've acquired over the years, and it kind of plays to my own uh, temperament and, and the way I see the world. So I think to, you know, to really kind of figure out how I arrived here, we kind of have to really go back to the beginning. Um, and I can actually remember, you know, even as a, a small child when I was, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years old, um, underneath my bed I had this box. It was a little bit bigger than a shoebox. Um, and in the box, I had all these little objects and trinkets that, for whatever reason, were very important to me. And they were like, you know, souvenirs, maybe toy soldiers, um, you know, foreign coins that my grandparents might have bought me. And I really loved just kind of going through this box and, you know, holding each object and kind of contemplating, you know, what it meant to me. And I can even remember, uh, you know, sitting in school, like on rainy afternoons, you know, just kind of looking forward to going home and, and, and having these kind of objects to hold and, you know, this that had some emotional resonance for me and, uh, and they provided some comfort, you know, to me. And that kind of tactile, you know, comfort, you can actually hold something in your hand, I guess has always kind of stayed with me. Um, I also want to, this is here I am as a puppy. Um, uh, I really started making dioramas uh, about 30 years ago um, when I arrived in New York after art school. 
Uh, as Jaime mentioned, I think I, I studied painting and printmaking in art school. Uh, but when I arrived in New York in the early 80s, um, I had a small space and uh, to make a living I worked in an architectural design, uh, art, no, an architectural supply store. And I found myself really drawn to the model building uh, materials uh, in the store. And I began making these uh, box constructions out of balsa wood. Um, and I painted them with this uh, wax paint, you know, called, um, uh, what's it called? Encaustic. Thank you, encaustic. <laughs> uh, where you have to work with the, uh, with the paint, the wax, while it's hot, and as, you, as it cools, it dries. And it gives you a lot of possibilities for textures and different kinds of surface finishes. And I love that you could kind of make these sort of old looking textures. And um, a lot of people have remarked that these boxes, and there's actually a little scene inside that you can see that I, and I made these little, you know, these little chairs and, and tables and things. And a lot of people have remarked that these look a little bit like old cameras. And, you know, up in, you know, in, Till this time, I really had somewhat of an ambivalent relationship with photography. I really always loved photographic images, um, but I wasn't—I I didn't have great experiences in the darkroom. Um, I found it really frustrating, um, and so I always incorporated photography more in terms of collage, uh, or photo printmaking, or here making things that looked like cameras. I guess. Um, I was also doing a lot of painting uh, at the time. Uh, I like to paint in oils. Um, I've always been in inspired uh, by art history. So I was drawn to sort of these older techniques and these uh, with you know glazing and painting layers on layers and layers. Um, and I liked oil painting because it was really slow and I tend to be pretty slow. Um, I do things pretty slowly. Um, and I like just reworking things <clears throat> going back into them and so I would kind of start with a very very you know loose idea in mind and kind of let the painting kind of take me you know wherever it would. Okay and then uh, eventually I discovered Photoshop and uh, by the, around 1990 I had left the architectural supply store um, and moved on to uh, a job doing graphic design for uh, the cable station HBO and they were really, the guy who ran the department was pretty forward thinking and he got Macs, you know, right when they, as soon as they came out. And so I began learning all the software, I, you know, PageMaker was the original thing, and then Adobe Illustrator. And then in 1990, Photoshop was introduced and um, I kind of dove into it right away. And for me, um, Photoshop, uh, was much more intuitive than the darkroom and it was much more like painting and printmaking for me and so right away I started kind of putting together a portfolio in Photoshop that really kind of combined what I had been doing you know um, in, in the analog fine art world uh, with things that I had been learning in the commercial world um, and before I knew it I had become this a sort of a freelance photo illustrator and I started, um, I left HBO and for, I don't know, the past 20 odd years I've been making these photo illust il illustrations, excuse me, freelance. Um, this was probably the, the first really, really big assignment uh, that I had. This was, I think, in 1994. Um, it was the uh, splash screen and packaging image for the uh, first version of Photoshop with layers. Um, version 3, right, 3.0. Yeah, um, <laughs> and so and the '90s was a great time to be a Photoshop illustrator because it was very much in demand, and uh, the internet w hadn't happened yet. Um, so there were still big budgets for photographers and illustrators, um, and for you know five or six or seven years, I had more work than I could possibly do. So I was constantly turning down work. Um, the interesting thing was that uh, the more I got into Photoshop, <clears throat> the more it kind of led me back into photography. Um, and so I wanted to become a, you know, a better photographer. And especially I wanted to uh, start photographing people because I wanted to have a wider range. Um, and I especially wanted to be able to do uh, book covers. 
Uh, and so I started graphing, photographing more people. This was actually an outtake from a, for a book cover, um, but I really like this image better than the one for the book cover. Um, and you can see I'm still very much into the retro thing. I can't seem to get quite past the mid-century, uh, the 20th century, um, but I'm getting there. Um, and eventually, uh, I began combining, you know, the photographing the people with the dioramas. You know, they came back in, into my life in a way. Um, and this was an illustration for um, a magazine about uh, the theme was uh, returning veterans and how the difficulties they have reintegrating with their families. Um, so. I, I found that I could actually, you know, kind of blend these things. The Photoshop allowed me to blend these different scales kind of seamlessly. And this opened up a lot of possibilities for me. And this was around, um, around 2007 or 8, <clears throat> I think. And by this time, I found myself uh, really, I really wanted to get uh, back into uh, fine art. Um, and I had really been away from it for quite a while. Um, and one thing that, that I learned was that if I wanted to be taken seriously as a fine artist was that I had to have a, a consistent body of work that really uh, you know, came from within me and uh, would be a number of images that held together as a series. And so I hit upon the idea of kind of reinterpreting you know, Edward Hopper paintings uh, photographically. Um, it just seemed like it would, I could, you know, the, the sets would be simple enough that I could build them. And I knew that I could, you know, kind of uh, convincingly uh, photograph the people and, and blend them into the scene. And so this was the first one that I did, the Hopper Meditations. And uh, I always played the males in, the, in them because um, I don't have to pay myself. Um, and I don't really smoke. No cigarettes were actually smoked. Um, it was done in Photoshop. Um, and the first, I think there are about 17 in this series. I'm not going to show all of them tonight because I want to talk more about the new work, of course. Um, but the first several that I did were actually based on Hopper painting. So, and I tried you know, to keep fairly close you know, to the um, to the content of the painting. Um, this one is probably his most, maybe his most famous painting, um, Morning Sun. Um, oops. And then as I got more into the series, um, I felt freer to kind of make my own compositions that were more just inspired you know, by, um, by his work. Um, so this one is called Pink Bedroom. And this is actually is the same diorama that I showed earlier in the lecture. Um, I did about four or five different images using that same diorama. And especially you could, you, I could turn it around and shoot it from different points of view and get a little more mileage out of it. Um, because the dioramas are, they're pretty time consuming to make. So I try to get as much mileage out of them as I can. <laughs> um, and again, I play the male. Um, and I still like doing book covers when I can. And this one was uh, adapted into a book cover. Uh, this was um, done about a year ago, I think. And they wanted to use the same model, but she was uh, overseas. So, and it, as it turned out, it worked out okay because the character that they wanted to illustrate had dark hair anyway. Um, so I didn't, I, all I had to do was repose the model. I didn't have to even rephotograph the diorama. Um, and I, I took off, they, you know, they, they, it was a present day novel. So um, I had, I, they didn't want the guy wearing the vest. So, you know, I, I was able to just take off the vest in Photoshop. So, and it made this you know, nice book cover. Um, so uh, while I was working on Hopper, um, I went to visit uh, Poland uh, with my wife, uh, Eva, who grew up there. And I was, and that's actually her in the lower left, looking up. 
um, I was really struck by the beauty of the architecture. And I was still in, in the middle of the Hopper series uh, when I visited, uh, but I always like to kind of have one project in the back of my head while I'm working on, I'd like to have the next project, I say, in the back of my head. So I don't end up in this kind of you know no man's land with not knowing you know, knowing what what am I going to do next you know, um, and I find that usually if I just stay open to it something will come to me you know so. Uh, knock on wood I'm kind of lucky I haven't really been hit you know at least and I'm I'm gonna you know I'm not that young you know really ever with the the block you know so, so um, and I knew that I wanted to do something uh, with uh, with the architecture that I saw in Poland. Um, now this is the one, the first one, this is the old city which has been beautifully renovated, but I also liked the parts that had not been renovated and they're just kind of the gritty um, sense of history that, that they, uh, these places had, the, the graffiti um, and just the way time had sort of worn away at these old, old buildings. Um, and these are the buildings that I kind of would use as uh, reference and as models, you know, for the project that I have just completed, you know, once upon a time in Kazimierz. Um, now, this particular building actually is not in Krakow. Um, Kazimierz, by the way, is the uh, historically Jewish neighborhood in Krakow. Um, and this, the the project that I decided to do, I wanted it to be. Uh, Really, I wanted to really tell more of a story than the Hoppers. The Hoppers, I really enjoyed working on the Hoppers, um, but all of the images were kind of isolated, uh, and they didn't really connect uh, other than stylistically. Um, and so, for this project, I wanted to really have an overarching narrative that would at least in a, suggest that they were all part of a story. And the more that I got into it, the more I actually thought of a more and more, you know, kind of solid story in my head, but I really still like to think of it as open-ended, and I really like to encourage, you know, every, every viewer to make their own interpretations. Um, so I love this old building. Uh, this was actually in a town in the south of Poland where my wife's parents grew up, um, and I was so, I loved this building, and then the next time I went back, they completely renovated it, and it was all painted shiny new, and it was really disappointing. Um, and this is actually uh, in the neighborhood of Kazimierz uh, in Krakow. And now, like the rest of the old city, it's all renovated and it's filled with um, shops and cafes and it's very, you know, it's bustling. Um, but I wanted to do something that, you know, took place in an older time. Um, uh, I'm really. I guess I've always been drawn to tragedy more so than, than anything else. Um, and I've also been kind of, I have this you know, strong connection with my family history. This is my great, great grandfather. Um, and that's actually not my grandmother. Hmm. <laughs> it would be, I suppose, my step great, great grandmother. He had a, the, the story goes he had a number of wives, you know. <laughs> And she was, I think, the last one, and she was much younger than he was. Um, so I wanted to do something that kind of maybe paid a little bit of homage, homage you know, to my origins and also to my wife's origins. Uh, so I developed this, I came up with this idea to make this sort of novella, you know, about this family uh, in Krakow that lived in the Jewish section in, say, around 1930. Um, and I wanted to place it around 1930 because, um, first of all, it's not too far back, and so that I actually have some connection with that time. And I didn't want to have, I wanted to have it sort of maybe in the shadow, <coughs> excuse me, the shadow of the Holocaust, but I didn't want to place it, you know, directly in the Holocaust because I felt that was just really beyond me, you know, to actually deal with that. So I didn't want to actually have, you know, soldiers or Nazis in it. But I wanted there to be kind of a foreboding darkness maybe present in the photographs. Um, so that was my idea, you know, to start. Um, so when I, you know, start a project, um, or even when I'm, you know, when I tell students, you know, who are about to start a project, you know, how, how to begin, um, 
what I like to do and, and suggest is that as much as possible, you know, you really immerse yourself, you know, in the subject. Um, you kind of want to get to the point where you're sort of living and breathing whatever it is that you're trying to tackle. Um, and what I find is that way is that even, you know, when you're not consciously thinking about it, you know, the gears are still turning, you know, in your unconscious. And that's when you come up with these ideas, you know, sort of, quote unquote, in the shower, you know, or wherever when you're, you know, taking a walk, you know, and then suddenly these ideas come up. So the first thing that, that I do for a new project, um, or this one, is I just start gathering reference. Um, and so, and I, what I like to do um, is make use of the digital tools that I have. So I just, you know, create a folder on my hard drive and just start throwing images into it. I create a number of folders, actually. Um, this one was for architectural reference, you can see. Um, then I'll create another one for hair and wardrobe um, reference, you know, doing research about that. And this is all really fun for me, you know, looking at this, this stuff up. And it's, of course, very, very easy to do now. You know, you don't have to go leave the house to do it. Um, and these, I actually, I, I use, um, I just use the browser, you know, Adobe's, you know, bridge. And that's what I use to browse through all these and open them up in Photoshop. <clears throat> And I also create a folder um, of reference just for composition, mood, and color. Okay? Um, and these might be any images that catch my eye you know, while I'm working on this project and that I might want to you know, steal something from. Um, and I, <clears throat> I don't really worry too much about stealing because I know it's always going to kind of be filtered by my own you know, sensibility. Um, and, and I don't mind paying homage to somebody, you know, I, I'm very comfortable with that. And so you can see a lot of the images are art history images or vintage photography images. Uh, some of them are contemporary photography images. And I try to always um, keep my eyes open for anything that just catches my attention. And, and I try to either take a screen grab or save it, you know, in a, in a folder and, and keep it handy. Um, <clears throat> I also make sure that I have these things um, usually on like my mobile stuff, you know, my iPad or my phone so that when I'm on the subway or anywhere out, I can, you know, and I have a free minute, I just go look through it and it keeps my mind kind of turning. And <clears throat> I also make sure that I have a, you know, a notebook that I can write down ideas in. Um, I find it, you know, to be really handy. So. Then when I'm, you know, when I'm feel really saturated and I'm ready to really start on the project, that's when I'll start actually building the the dioramas. Um, and so I, you know, I have my little my visual reference, you know, on the top, and then I'll actually draw uh, the plans for, in this case, for the building in Adobe Illustrator, and those will be my quote unquote blueprints, you know, for the project. Uh, and then I'll just start building. And I'll use, you know, any material that really, that works, you know, whether it's wood or cardboard, uh, whatever will, will get the job done. Um, that's my assistant. Um, he, he, he doesn't, you know, I don't have to pay him, but he's, he's kind of short. Uh, so th those are the windows. And this is the front of the building, you know, one of the buildings um, in the, you know, in con the construction phase. And then this is, you know, the building after I've, the front after I've finished and, and painted it. Um, and you can kind of see if I, I put the painting, you know, after it, where, you know, the, the things that I liked about painting, I'm still able to, you know, to bring back, you know, into this process. So even though I'm not actually, you know, making paintings, I still get to paint. And, you know, I really just like that part of working with my hands, and there's something that's really kind of therapeutic about it. And then, you know, after I've, you know, while I'm building the sets, I'm sort of casting, you know, the, uh, the project. And I really like choosing the models because it makes me feel very powerful. Um, but it really, it, it really is fun. And people ask me, where do I find the models? And um, 
Different places. Uh, a lot of them I find on um, a website, uh, Model Mayhem, which is where uh, you, you can uh, find all kinds of models. There are thousands and thousands of models. Um, the only problem is that sometimes the models, you know, it can be hard to get in touch with models quickly over that website. Um, but for this kind of project, I had plenty of time. Um, and sometimes the models are friends of mine. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the main uh, male lead in, in this project was a trainer at my gym. You know, I just liked the way he looked and his beard, and he was into it. So it worked out really well. And so after I've chosen the model, um, I'll start doing sort of these little rough photo, you know, photo references for the photo shoot. I'll, you know, actually schedule a photo shoot with the model. And by this time, I have a pretty good idea, you know, of what the composition is. And one thing I, I like is that um, the, the process is very flexible. So a lot of the images I'll have in mind ahead of time. But a lot of the poses will be improvised by the model, too. And sometimes that leads to images that I hadn't even thought of. So you can see that, you know, again, it's my wide range of, of paintings and photographs. And you can see in the middle there's a little shot of the, you know, half-finished diorama with my little assistant in there. He helps me out a lot, and that's why. He's very good at this, actually. Um, and this is what I'll actually take, you know, to the photo shoot. And I'll use these as reference when I'm posing the model. Um, and the photo shoot is, you know, it's really one of my favorite um, aspects of the project because it's, the mo I guess, by far the most social. Um, so I'm actually working with other people. But in a way, it's also the most stressful um, because um, there's a limited you know, amount of time. I'm paying the models. I'm paying the stylist. Um, I've rented the clothes. Um, so that, in a way, it, it kind of adds to sort of the, the high you know, the, and the energy. But I'm also kind of glad that I don't do it every single day, you know, that <clears throat> I do it. You know, in fact, as I tell people, they say, how long did it take to do the project? And I'll say, well, the actual photographs are probably about two or three weeks, but everything else is about two years, you know, which is pretty accurate. Um, so that's, the, that's my, my leading lady, uh, Zoe, um, and I found her on Model Mayhem, and she was absolutely marvelous to work with. Um, and that's my hair, style, hair and makeup stylist, Fallon, and she, I've worked with her on the hoppers as well, and she does... She's simply amazing. And Zoe had like this long, wavy hair. And I had told Fallon before that I wanted it, you know, kind of up the way these women, women wore it in the 30s. And she said, oh, that's no problem, you know. And it really wasn't. And she had braided, you know, put in all these tiny braids and then tucked it up, you know, into her hair. And you couldn't see it at all. So it was really this wonderful transformation. Um, and so then I just take um, a lot of photographs against uh, a plain backdrop. Um, and uh, the dress is actually a, a vintage dress that, um, that I rented. Um, and the, uh, I was very fortunate you know, to find this uh, place in the garment district that rents uh, costumes. And the woman that works there is very knowledgeable about historical fashions, and so she was a very good guide, you know, for me in saying, oh, "No, no, that wouldn't. That was that's 40s, not 30s, you know, you know." So, um, so I felt good about that. Um, so I would take, you know, I think I've, I mean, I probably took four or five hundred photographs of of Zoe um, that day, and a few different, you know, a couple different costume changes um, with different props and things. And, you know, that would last me about a year, I think. And then I had one more photo shoot about a year after that, you know, with Zoe to finish up um, the rest of those. Um, and so this, this was the actual pose that, uh, you know, became this. Um, and this was the first image in the series. Um, and the title of this one is called The Taylor's Wife. And I imagine this family um, as 
being in the, you know, that the husband is a tailor, because that was a very common profession for, um, for Jews, uh, well, for a long time, but especially back then in the 30s in Europe. And so this is called The Tailor's Wife. And I, I chose not to name the characters because uh, I, I wanted to leave it open-ended. I didn't want to, people to have associations, I guess, with certain names or things like that. So I chose not to name the characters. Um, but I made a decision that I wanted, you know, the first few images to uh, function, I guess, as what, you know, we learn back in the English class is called the exposition, you know, where you're just setting the stage for the story. So you're introducing the characters and the setting. And so this is the, the um, next image. Um, actually, there's one missing, but never mind. Um, and I call this one Working Morning. And so this, this is really the, the current, the, you know, the family at the beginning of the story as I see it. And so you've got the, the husband who's the tailor, and then you've got his wife. Um, and I think of the other woman as his mother. So it's her mother-in-law. And <clears throat> most people, I guess, unless you know a little bit about that culture and that history, you know, you wouldn't, you probably you might not be able to tell much, but if you you know if you know a little bit, um, as I learned, you can tell from his sorry from his dress that he's pretty religious and traditional, uh, and you can tell by her dress and her mo our mother-in-law's dress uh, because first of all because their elbows are showing, which a traditional you know uh, religious Jewish woman wouldn't allow her elbows you know to be showing. And also, they're wearing makeup, which is an, another thing that a religious Jewish woman, especially at that time, would, would not have done, most likely would not have done. Um, so I wanted to suggest this sort of tension you know, in the family, in a very, but in a very subtle way. Um, and also, you can see on the right, you can't really tell, but that's a picture of a, one of the historical uh, you know, Jewish rabbis who, you know. So my thinking is that this guy is still very religious, and, and, uh, but there's something going on because his mother and his wife have sort of strayed a little bit, but we don't really know why. You know. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the neighborhood that I placed the story in, Kajimersh, um, also is kind of a, a metaphor itself for uh, loss and decay in that it had once been a really vibrant cultural center but by this time in the 1930s it had really fallen kind of into, uh, into a, a very kind of low point and so that the only people that still lived there were considered very poor and ultra religious. And so this sort of continues the exposition, and this is, uh, you know, their simple dinner. Um, and um, the challenging thing about this, doing this particular image, was that I wanted to have, you know, the food on the table, uh, and of, and I wanted it to blend with the, you know, the miniature set, um, but. I couldn't use mini food because it didn't, it looked like, you know, mini food. <laughs> you know, I wanted it to look like real food. So the only thing that, so the people are full size and the food is full size, but everything else is miniature, you know, the table and the chairs and everything. So to get that to blend was, was for me kind of, was, was probably the most time consuming, you know, uh, montage, you know, in the series. Also, it was a bit tricky because, um, for almost all of the um, images, except I, th I think for this one, the main light is actually a, like a, an artificial, like a speed light or a, or a strobe coming in off camera. But in this image, it's actually being the interior, except for the people, is actually being lit by that little dollhouse light um, that, that's actually you know, functioning as a light. So that was a little tricky, getting that to blend right. Um, and, and because it's digital, there was some noise I had to deal with, so that was tricky. Um, and this one, again, is, you know, this one is very much absolutely based on this painting by Van Gogh, uh, and in, which is called The Potato Eaters. I gave it the same title, so I'm not, like, I'm, I'm uh, acknowledging, you know, the theft, at least. You know. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, I'm just noticing uh, the wife's gesture, the way she holds her fork. I, 
it's right in the center? Is that intentional <laughs> in some way? Or <laughs> oh, I'm so fu it's so funny you ask that. Um, you know, because um, this this was like the last uh, scene that I shot that day, and we ran really really late because my my usually punctual hairstylist was like an hour and a half late, so we were everybody was tired and cranky and we were rushing and um, I forgot to tell them how to hold the silverware <laughs> and you know and my wife who is my you know my European advisor on this you know she looked, she goes oh you blew it <laughs> you know they're not holding the silverware right and so I did the best I could but um, he you know She's okay, and he's okay. It's really Zoe that, that, you know, she should be holding it a little bit differently. So, but it's not, at least she's not, like, eating with her, you know, with her right hand, like, you know, like that. You know, because they would, they would spear it with the left hand and, and go like that. You know, cut it like this and spear it. So. <laughs> Good eye. <yeah. laughs> uh, this is probably the happiest picture I've ever done. Um, probably the only happy picture I've ever done. Um, and it's, I, it's a flashback, really. Um, and that's how I mean it to function um, in the story. Uh, in the story, the, the couple at one time had a son, and the son is no longer present. We assume he died. We don't know how. Um, so this goes back, this flashes back to a happier time. Um, and so the title I this one this one I call is Once Upon a Time, which sort of plays on both the fact that he's reading a book, and that but it also is thinking of of a happier time. Uh, and in this one, unlike the other ones, uh, the wife you can see is dressed much more modestly. You know, she has her hair covered and her elbows are covered. So at this point, she was still more she was traditional. Um, now you wouldn't really know it probably unless I told you, but the idea. For this photograph, I actually came from this photograph by Dwayne Michaels, um, who I'm a, you know, I've always been a big fan of Dwayne Michaels, um, and he, you know, was kind of a pioneer in this sort of you know stage storytelling uh, work, um, and he would also, uh, you know, a lot of times add writing to it. So, you know, when you look at this, you just see this, you know, this photograph of this happy couple. <clears throat> and you think, oh, what a nice, you know, it's a nice happy couple. And then you read the, the little caption, and, you know, the caption says, this photograph is my proof that there was that afternoon when things were still good between us, and she embraced me, and we were so happy. It did happen. She did love me. Look, see for yourself, you know. So, you know, it, then it kind of transforms the way you see the photograph. So it really becomes about loss, you know, and not about happiness, per se. Uh, so this is, you know, the next photograph, and, and this one I kind of wanted to, you know, maybe this is a little heavy-handed, but I wanted to get across the idea that they, they were grieving, you know, the, for this son. So I have the photograph of the son in the background, and then there's a, you know, there's a tear, you know, for, coming from her eye. And the title of this one is called Shakris, and. Shachris is the Hebrew word for morning prayers in the um, in Hebrew uh, ritual. Um, if you're an <coughs> Orthodox Jew, you you know you're you're re uh, required to pray three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. And the morning is called uh, Shachris. And <coughs> so, in this, the I, my thinking in in this image is that you know he's kind of dealing with his grief, you know, by you know in religion and tradition. And for her, it just kind of isn't working, you know. And so she's kind of gone away from that. And so she's got, there's the, you know, she's kind of crying against the bed, and, and uh, this picture of the sun is on the floor. And so it kind of illustrates the sort of schism, you know, in the, in the marriage. Um, this one I like to think of as a, sort of a dream image. Um, where uh, he sort of returns to visit his mother in a, in a dream. Um, and and uh, because that's kind of, you know, she kind of can't, she, she thinks about him all day, she dreams about him at night. Um, and I don't actually have it, but I actually made a family photograph. You can see it on the wall in the background. 
I think it's on my website. Um, but uh, and it's actually in the ex if you get a chance to go to the exhibition at, at Clam Ching, it's actually framed there. Um, and a lot of people thought it was actually my family, but it's it's the actors, you know, you know, dressed up. Um, so it was a prop for this. Okay, so, um, and this is one of the images that I did really that I wanted to try to kind of push the story along uh, in terms of the, um, the narrative. And so I'm kind of introducing this sort of, a more, you know, this kind of dark character, you know, uh, played by me, um, who is a customer of the, of the tailors. And the idea is that he's being, you know, measured for, you know, pants or whatever. And the title of it is called Measuring. Um, but <clears throat> the idea is that he's sort of, you know, he's eyeing the wife who's working at the table. And then, uh, so he's sort of measuring her. And then there's sort of this image of the rabbi, old rabbi, is kind of, you know, watching down on her as well. So she's kind of stuck, you know, in the middle. Um, and <clears throat> this particular image, um, whenever I kind of, in the images that I have this sort of dark character in, who I kind of wanted to sort of uh, embody kind of, you know, evil or this coming menace, whatever, um, I used, um, I, I kind of, I tried a lot to look at sort of um, uh, uh, film noir images. Um, I never got it quite as shadowy as I was hoping to, but but I got the idea across. And I also changed the lens in my camera to a wide-angle lens so that the space I want is a little bit more distorted. Um, uh, and so you'll see in the, all these images with him in it, it the space is, you know, it's, it's a much wider angle lens. And so the idea is that she begins to sort of, or maybe it's, you know, a one-time thing, this illicit affair, you know, in her grief or whatever, you know, she kind of uh, <laughs> exhibits this sort of self-destructive behavior. And, but I wanted to have sort of, sort of show her, her little, you know, journey. And along the way, I wanted to have some kind of little street scene, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, so... This, say, is maybe not quite where she lives, but it's another neighboring street where she's not quite as well known. So the little girl is, is kind of eyeing her, you know, as she's going into the apartment building. And these are just kind of two local guys, in, you know, kind of posing for the camera. And then this older guy watching the little girl. That's me, actually, too, by the way. I play that guy. Um, uh, and this was actually, this was one of the more difficult ones to... Um, for me to get it to blend, to get the figures to blend in the in the scene, because and I think because the lighting in this is a little bit different. Uh, in most of the other ones, the lighting is more uh, direct; it's you know fairly hard lighting. In this one, it's almost like a cloudy day. The lighting is very diffuse, and I find it much more more of a challenge to actually blend the figures in this one. Okay, so then she, she you know she enters the apartment building, and this one. Um, I call it ascending because she's ascending the stairs. Um, and then you can see also the little girl has, has followed her in, you know, and she's just kind of curious by this, what's this woman doing here? And so she's going up to this guy's apartment. And uh, the title, um, Ascending, um, in one sense I think it seems kind of counterintuitive because in a way she's really kind of lowering, lowering herself, you know, going down into a kind of a dark place. Um, but I kind of liked that it was a little bit counterintuitive. And then um, I just learned something, you know, this past week that I didn't know that made it, you know, gave it another layer for me. Um, that in ancient Jewish ritual, um, like, you know, when, uh, like 2,000 years ago, when there was a temple, and you know, and all the Jews went to this one temple in Jerusalem to pray, and they would make animal sacrifices uh, at the temple. And there was a sacrifice that was called the burnt offering, where an animal would be entirely burned, you know, on the altar. <clears throat> and the idea was that it was complete submission to God, because the animal would be completely incinerated, and all the smoke would go up to God. And that uh, offering was uh, was called the Ola. 
And a lot of people think that ola means burnt offering, but what it, it, what it actually means is ascension, because the smoke is going up to God. <laughs> and that was just very weird when I learned that. You know, I didn't know that when I titled it. Um, but I was actually very, um, th this was one of the more difficult dioramas with the stairway. I was very proud of that. Uh, and this image is actually not in the exhibition. This is another one that I kind of did uh, just to sort of push the narrative along. And this was another one that was really inspired by uh, film noir. And I wanted to kind of make sure you knew that this, who the guy was, I suppose. Maybe it's a little heavy-handed. but. And then this one, which is kind of, you know, her, you know, afterwards. And, you know, she feels, you know, just kind of as low as a person can possibly feel. Um, and <clears throat> I remember when I was photographing um, Zoe for this, I told her, you know, what I wanted to portray, and I had her lit, you know, this kind of, this light in a certain way, and I thought, oh, that's perfect, that's perfect, and I took the picture, and then, of course, the great thing about digital photography is that it, you know, it's instant gratification. You can see exactly, you know, what you get right away. And so I thought, oh, that's perfect. And then I looked at the photograph, and it looked exactly like the opposite of what I want. It looked like, oh, that was great, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had to keep working, you know. And eventually, we we got there, you know. <laughs> so this one was, you know, definitely inspired by photographs by Bill Brandt, who was um, a, a German, German-born photographer who worked mostly in Britain uh, around World War II. Um, and so I was really inspired by both of these photographs. It's almost a combination of the two. So he used this very wide-angle lens, too, in this, this really, you know, um, uh, up-close image of the sil silhouette of the woman. So that's what, <clears throat> that's what inspired that image. Um, and so then, uh, you know, this image was about sort of, you know, I suppose it, the dissolution, I, I say, of the, of the relationship. Um, and you can see there's a there's somebody maybe the mother-in-law in the in the window up above, um, and the interesting thing is that so, some people tell me that it, they think that the husband is kicking her out, you know, um, but in my mind um, the husband actually you know would forgive her. But it's like she can't forgive herself, and so that's why you know it's more her choice to leave than that he's kicking her out. What's the poster? Um, oh, the poster! I'll show you more. That's actually um, there are more posters in the next image. Um, that was another fun part was finding these uh, old Yiddish posters um, online that might have been on the buildings then. Um, you know, Yiddish was the language that European Jews used until well, until there were no more European Jews. Um, and if, you know, some of the Orthodox Jews, you know, in America still speak it. Um, it's a form of, I guess, mostly Old German mixed with a little bit of Hebrew. And the characters, though, are all Hebrew characters. Uh, so those are old, you know, Yiddish and sometimes Yiddish and Polish posters because, of course, they spoke Polish too. So a lot of times the posters were in both languages. Um, but I think the poster um, with the uh, face on it is a theater poster. Uh, there was a lot of Yiddish theater um, in Krakow. Krakow's always been a cultural center, even, even then. So this is another one, and this one I call the intervention. Um, and so you can see there are more posters there that are both in Polish and in Yiddish. Um, and I like to think of this one uh, as the mother trying to convince, just this is just me, and I don't want to spoil anybody else's thoughts, you know. In my mind, she's trying to convince the wife not to leave, you know. Um, I <clears throat> I like to think of that there's a bond between these two women, even though they don't share blood. Um, I like that idea, um, but I left it kind of open-ended. So, and there's the husband who feels somewhat powerless, you know, still in the background. Um, I would also add, I'm oh, sorry. That probably the single longest the, the, the single longest element that took to make was the cobblestone street, because I actually had to make all the cobblestones. <laughs> so, what did you make them I made them out of foam core, <laughs> actually. <laughs> These little pieces of foam core that I would cut and then crush with my fingers at night watching television. <laughs>
Um, this isn't my image, actually. Okay, this is a famous painting by uh, the Italian surrealist, uh, Giorgio Di Chirico, and I always love this image. Um, and I think I knew, you know, not long after I started the project that I wanted to kind of take a crack, you know, at this image and that it would be the last image, you know, in the series. Um, and I, I, I confess I still like his painting better than my image, but um, I still love his painting. So this is the image that was based on his, his painting. Um, and I gave it the same title. I love the title, too, um, The Mystery and Melancholy of a Street. It, you know, it's so poetic. And so in this image, you know, there's a, this kind of surreal, almost like a, you know, dreamy landscape. Um, and the boy is sort of walking or running down the street, and there's a shadow coming. Um, and so I think of this as very much as sort of a dream or otherworldly image. And, you know, again, I can't kind of help myself from, you know, making up stories about it. And I see him as sort of running towards there's a shadow coming, and I think of it as his mother, you know, and this, this kind of otherworldly or spiritual reunion with his mother. You know, that's kind of what I think, how I think of it. Um, but again, it's very dreamy. And <clears throat> I tried to kind of mimic the sense of distortion, you know, from the surrealist painting, in that the buildings are shot kind of with two different um, angle lenses. So. The, the building on the left is a, you know, a, um, an, uh, more of a wide angle uh, lens than the one on the right to kind of help, you know, kind of bend the space a little bit. And that is how the story ends. Thank you. When you're um, compositing, your photographs with the dioramas, how do you get the scale of the photographic elements to fit into the scale of the diorama? Is there some formula or is that just judgment? Judgment. <laughs> There's no formula. In fact, I always worry that somebody's going to figure out that the scale doesn't match from, you know, how come he's taller on this one than that one, you know? And I, try, I, I mean, I try to keep it consistent, but, but I basically, I just do it by eye and what feels right. And sometimes I go, I was just working on one the other day, and, and I, you know, I worked on it for a couple hours, left for about an hour, came back, and I'm like, oh, he's too big, you know? So it's more judgment. So I kind of have a follow-up question to that in terms of the scale of lighting. Um, so I recently actually worked on a project with small paper things, and I realized mm -hmm. very quickly that even the biggest, softest lights would end up casting very hard shadows and totally kind of distort the, the classic ideas that I understood of how <laughs> light should work, you know? Is that hard to, to, to put together that That's way? So Somebody just asked me that. You didn't email me, did you? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, I just use whatever modifiers I need. I mean, a lot of times for, I'll have to aim the light, so I'll use either, I mean, I found that for the dioramas, I use mostly speed lights. So I'll either <coughs> have a, a grid that I'll attach to the light, or I'll make a snoot out of either, you know, a modifier or um, a cinefoil. And so I can get a really pretty good pinpoint. And then for if I want it soft, you know, I mean, I have a small space, and I'll usually, I, I sometimes I'll use an umbrella, but a lot of times I'll just bounce it off a ceiling or a wall. Do you find yourself using also those tiny little, you mentioned using a model light in one of them, like the actual? You know, I don't, because the problem is that I can't get enough light out of them, even for like, um, what is this? Mm. This one, a lot of the light is coming from the overhead, but what I did was I found this little kind of uh, plastic half globe almost. So I used that as a fixture, and then I cut a hole in the ceiling and put a speed light on top and triggered it, you know, that way. But the problem I found with the model lights was that I couldn't get enough light so that I couldn't. I ended up having to use, you know, too wide an aperture, and then, 
and they, you know, I didn't have enough, you know, field, depth of field, so. Hi, sir. Uh, thanks for coming to this lecture. I really love your work. And uh, before my question, I would like to say, so Hopper and uh, Kiliko, they're my favorite artists. So, so the first painting that uh, for the, ho the Hopper is the room by the sea. The other Hopper's painting. Um, I, th I didn't understand the question. My favorite ho Edward Hopper painting that uh, the first time I see his work is the room by the sea. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't do that one. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so my question is, so I have two questions. The first question is, how do you balance the sharpness because it is compositing? So when you do the, the miniature shot and you do the, the, the people, mm -hmm. you, so I can see that sometimes it's uh, really hard to control the sharpness and the depth of field. Yeah. <coughs> um, well, especially when I did the hoppers, has, um, a lot of them have a very shallow depth of field. Um, so I had to often had to blur the figure or part of the figure to get it to match. I mean, I, I know that there's this really uh, a common desire to have like these super, super sharp images. Fortunately, I don't have that <laughs> hang up. <laughs> so to me, it's more important that things are balanced. So you can get away with something being not sh razor sharp if it's next to something that's not as sharp as it. <laughs> Um, so for usually when I, almost every time when I put the figure in, the figure is too sharp. Um, so I'll have to soften the figure almost invariably um, to match the background, to match the miniatures. And, uh, and in a way, I, don't, I almost don't want the, the set to be super, super sharp because then every little flaw you know, shows up in it. Um, so it's really, it's kind of a balancing act you know, in terms of what you can get away with and what you can't in terms of mini being miniature, you know. And some things you think are going to work and they don't work, and other things you're surprised that they work as well as they do. So. I mean, I was surprised that when I f did the hoppers that there were people that didn't know that they were miniatures. I thought for sure you would know right away, but a lot of people don't. So. Um, my second question is, I'm kind of curious because you talk about your once upon this this project, so I'm curious, because I really love I really love Hopper's work. So my question is, why give the title is med meditation to the Hopper's work? Why give the title meditate Hopper meditation? Uh, because it was sort of um, my meditations on Hopper, I suppose. You know, um, <clears throat> and they're very quiet. They're very you know I think of them as very meditative. I tend to be very meditative, so it seemed like. I mean, what I love about Hopper's paintings is sort of the stillness in them. Um, and not just the stillness, but the kind of the drama that he's able to find in the stillness, you know? Um, and somehow I just, I like the title, Hopper Meditations, you know? Um, you had a very successful Kickstarter um, action, and I'm sure people would be interested in it know how you did it, what it entailed, and, and you know, what do you think about that now? Um, uh, yeah, I did a Kickstarter campaign to fund um, the, um, in terms of preparing for the exhibition. Um, and I was really nervous at first because I had some friends that had had successful Kickstarter campaigns. Um, and. I had three friends that had successful campaigns, and two of them said, D don't, it's too much work, don't even bother, you know, it's just so much work. You know, and then uh, the third friend said, it's a lot of work, but you should do it, you should do it. You know? um, and I'm really glad I did it. It was really, um, I mean, I'm you know, grateful it was successful, um, but it was really, really fun uh, for me to do it. Um, it was a great experience, and, and um, I do think that uh, it's important that if you're going to do a Kickstarter that you have a pretty, a pretty good presence on social media because that was by far and away how most of my funds were raised. Um, one of my friends, actually is a, my cousin, who did a, you know, ran a successful Kickstarter and he didn't have a big social media presence and he was able to do it successfully because he had so many other connections and people that did have a presence, you know, 
and he did fundraisers. He, you know, he worked. To, he really worked his tail off. Um, you know, for me, it was mostly social media, but also family and friends. A lot. I mean, I got. I was a really generous contributions from family and friends from people that I knew. Maybe thirty or forty percent of the contributions. Maybe thirty percent were from people that I knew. Um, and it is a lot of work, um, but I think you have to be careful. Um, I was I was very lucky because um, my my uh, gallerist Darren Ching, who's in the back, um, was very helpful to me in terms of um, designing rewards for it. I I don't think it would have been nearly as successful if I hadn't had <coughs> you know Darren's input in that. Um, so it's, I think it's important to do it in a very mindful way, you know, and, to <clears throat> and talk to as many people as you can before you jump into it if you're going to do it. But I, I'm really thrilled with how it worked out. And it was, you know, it was a fair amount of work doing the fulfillment and getting all the rewards out. But, but it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm curious about um, the personal and very site-specific story about Poland. It's, it's, it's not really a commercial. <laughs> no, I'm no. finding that out, yes. So where do you think, uh, just yeah. from your own philosophy, this was a personal mm -hmm. story. Do you think it has any commercial value? Now today, in today's world, it appears to me that it is very timely. How uh, do you think this can get out into the world? Uh, the, the question is, this project, Kajimir, seems to be a very personal project and not very commercially minded. How do you think it will? How you think it can get out into the world? You know, given that sensibility, is that correct? It is correct. Okay. And the fact that we're at a time in uh, the political world right mm -hmm. now, it seems timely to me because of prejudice of all kinds of. Uh, Survival. Yeah, no, I think it. I think it is timely, but uh, and I th and I think the themes really are timeless. I mean, when I was, I mean, first of all, you know, it's important to. I think you know, as an artist, you don't. You have limited choices in terms of what you're. You have to do something that you feel strongly about, um, because I think you know every artist's kind of goal is to make an emotional connection with the viewer. At least that's my goal. Um, and so, in order to do that, you have to do something that you feel emotionally connected to. Um, so this was a story that I wanted to tell, and I didn't, you know, even though I think, obviously, if you, you know, if you have an origin that's similar to what the, you know, the story, the content of the story, that is one way into it. But I did want, you know, I didn't want to limit it, you know, I, to that. So I tried to choose themes that I thought are universal, you know, such as, you know, love and loss, you know. And grief, um, and that's what I hope will speak to people. You know, um, in terms of, you know, I, I guess I don't. You know, I want. I like. To, I want to make things that are, you know, beautiful. Still, you know, and hopefully that will find a way. You know, I can understand why. You know, it. It's not, you know, something that everyone might want on their over their couch. You know. Um, but I want, I see it still, to me, I still get comfort, you know, some, from like looking at some of these types of images, and that's kind of what I'm hoping for. You know, they have an edge to them. They're wonderful. Thank you. Magnificent. I mean, just absolutely magnificent, so that without the story part, I think that they have their own strength. Each image has its own strength. Well, that was my hope. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, and I think, I mean, honestly, some of the images uh, were almost, were, you know, I did almost as vehicles to push the narrative along. So, 
they might be a little, I, I can see where they would be a little di more difficult to read, you know, if you didn't know the rest of the story. Um, but I, I still, I, I, I never really made an image that I thought couldn't stand on its own, uh, you know. So, uh, in respect to your dioramas and your props, I would assume that they're very um, sensitive and fragile. Was there ever a time that either something broke, and if so, did you incorporate that in, into something? Did you keep like a break, or did you just go back and fix it so it was back to normal? Oh, uh, the question is, these things are fragile, the, the little diorama and the prop things are fragile. Do I ever, do they break? And if they break, do I repair them or do I kind of let it be a happy accident? Is that so? Yeah. Um, well, they are fragile uh, and <clears throat> I can get very frustrated at times, you know, when, when things break as, um, you know, a lot of times it's not a pretty process <laughs> because I can get very, I'm very into it and, you know, my wife will tell you that I, you know, I can get very frustrated, you know. With it. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that happens more, I'm able to, I think, to hold things together enough, you know. They only have to stay together long enough for me to make, take the photograph. So I'm usually able to do that. I think the accidents almost happen more when I'm painting things, you know, and they don't turn out the way I thought they were going to turn out. Um, or, or even when I was doing the cobblestones, I wasn't sure how they were going to turn out. I'd never done it before. Um, so I kind of just go with it and see what happens when I photograph it. You never, it's almost like it's hard to tell sometimes until you actually photograph it, what it's going to look like. And the lighting changes everything too. Um, and a lot of times I'll spend time, you know, on one little detail of this window and then it doesn't even show, you know, in the, <laughs> in the, in the final photograph. So. You just never know. But I try to think of it all. It's all part of the process. <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question. but okay. um, You mentioned uh, that when you're working on a project, in the back of your mind, you are looking ahead at the next project. Do you want to give us a teaser, like a world preview here? <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, I'll just I'll, I'll say that I, you know, I haven't started it yet, but I, have, I do have a, a project in the back of my mind. And, um, one thing that I found is that the older, as I've gotten older, my work has tended to become more and more personal, you know? Um, and so the next project is probably even <laughs> more personal. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say that about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.